morning and welcome to the AmokArts.com video message of the week. Our message today is entitled, Cast of Characters Jacob. What comes around goes around and around and around and around. And my text for this message is Genesis 32. We're in our third message in a series based on the book, Cast of Characters Lost and Found by Max Lucado. This particular chapter was on Jacob, one of the great characters in all scripture, but I really hate to use the term characters when I'm referring to Bible people, because I don't want people to think that these were fictional characters. They weren't. They were real people. Oddly enough, Jacob was a real person, but you could also say he was a real character. He was the second son son of Isaac and Rebekah. You could say he was the second son, though by seconds, because he was actually a twin. His slightly older brother was Esau, and Esau was entitled to a lot more than Jacob was. You see, in Bible times, the oldest son got a double portion of the inheritance. Esau was entitled to twice as much of Isaac's estate as Jacob was. That being said, you need to know that Jacob and Esau literally started fighting each other in the womb. There was always such a struggle between them. As a matter of fact, before they were born, Rebecca got a little worried over the battle royale that was happening in her womb, and she went to the Lord. God told Rebecca, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. That's Genesis 25, 23. So this sets the stage for the battle. Twins will be born that will want, be in constant battle. And that's what happened from day one. The twins are born. Esau comes out first, but he's born with a hand around his heel. Jacob is holding on for dear life, still trying to be first. Jacob's name means he grasps at the heel. That's the literal meaning. But it also means trickster or he will deceive. And we'll see that both meanings are equally applicable. The boys are polar opposites. Jacob is born smooth-skinned. Esau is born red-headed and hairy from birth. I've never heard of such a thing, but that's what the Bible says. Jacob likes hanging around camp and cooking and taking care of things and all that, while Esau is a rugged outdoorsman, always hunting wild game. And here's where we run into trouble. Esau is his father Isaac's favorite son, but Jacob is Rebekah's favorite. Having a favorite child is a recipe for disaster. Each parent sides with one kid, the parents divide, the kids divide, the family divides, and you have what Isaac had, two factions in a family battling for control. I love the Bible. In it, God gives us very honest portrayals of real people. He shows us where his people messed up so that we can learn, hopefully, from their mistakes. Now you might say, wait a minute, God told them in advance this would happen. This is what God wanted to happen. I don't think so. Do you think God wanted all this deception and all this strife? No, that's sin. Do you think God wants this family to be a mess? No. Here's what happened. God gave these people free will. And the choices they made were their own. What happened here is not necessarily what God wanted to happen, so much as it is what God knew would happen. He knew the choices the people would make because God knows everything and God somehow made it work. We have the same free will in us to make good and right choices or bad and foolish choices. And he puts his word in our lives so that we can find the right choices and make them. Here we have a messed up family with two parents working against each other trying to advance their favorite kid. One day Esau is out hunting all day and Jacob's home making soup. When he gets home, Esau is famished. He's starving. And he smells Jacob's good home cooking. Starving, he asks his brother for a bowl of soup. Now, in an ordinary healthy family, Jacob would have had compassion on his brother and fed him. He may have even thought, if I share with Esau, maybe he'll give me some game so I can cook up something tasty. That's what would happen in a healthy family. In Isaac's family, Jacob says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some soup for your birthright. In other words, you can have some of my soup if you give me all your rights as firstborn. Esau is so hungry, he says yes. Esau gave up a third of Isaac's rather sizable estate, not to mention a whole bunch of rights for a bowl of soup. Now the older really will serve the younger. What an idiot, right? Hold on. What do we do? 
How often do we trade future blessings for immediate gratification? How often do we trade a great life for temporary happiness? How often do we trade God's blessings for the things of this world? Esau's choice is idiotic. Make no mistake about it. But before we jump on him too quickly, we need to look at our own choices. Why do I say it like this? Do you think God recorded this behavior because he's proud of how they acted? No. God recorded this so his people would look at it, learn from it, and make better choices. Another time Jacob lived up to his name of trickster was nearing the end of Isaac's life. Isaac was nearly blind and dying and wanted Esau to go out and get him one last meal of the wild game he loves so much. Isaac's plan was, I'll send my firstborn out, get him, let him get me my last meal. When he comes back, I'll eat my last meal. Give Esau the traditional blessing of the oldest son and soon after die. Jacob, with the help of his mother, hatched a scheme to steal the blessing as well. Jacob had now taken everything from Esau. There was now only one avenue Esau could see, revenge. Esau consoled himself, the Bible tells us, with the fact that once Isaac died, he would kill his younger brother. Jacob found out about it and fled. He ended up the house of, at the house of a relative named Laban, and something strange happened. The trickster started getting tricked. He worked seven years to be married to Laban's daughter, Rachel. But Laban pulled the switch, and Jacob ended up married to his other daughter, Leah, instead. And she wasn't desirable to Jacob. Jacob had to work seven more years for the wife he wanted. You could say that was really unfair, or you could say what comes around goes around. After he had worked for his wives, Jacob began to work to have a flock of his own, to have something of his own. And Laban made a deal that he would give all the striped and speckled animals to Jacob. And surprise of surprises, most of the animals were born that way, making Jacob very rich and Laban very poor. You could say that was really unfair, or you could say what comes around goes around. Jacob ended up getting two wives, actually four if you count their servants, and eleven sons, because the twelfth isn't born yet at this time who became the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. And he became quite wealthy in the process. And that's all really great. But you know how it is when you're living your life under a shadow? You know what I mean. It's like you know there's something out there in the world, someone out there in the world who has something against you and they're right. You may have a pretty blessed life, but there is someone out there who could really mess you up. You may be pretty happy, but you're waiting for what comes around to go around. There's someone out there who wants to get even. There's something out there that is going to come back to bite you, that's going to make the bottom fall out. You can't really enjoy your blessings because you know trouble might still come. This is why the Bible says be, fure, be sure your sin will find you out. I don't believe in karma, but I do believe in this verse, which basically says what comes around goes around. This is why Jesus told Matthew told us in Matthew 5.23, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go and first be reconciled to your brother, then come offer your gift. It's why Paul told us in Romans 12.18, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. The admonition, admonition is pretty simple. Make things right with the people in your life. Stop trying to save face and fix what's broken. Stop what comes around before it goes around. Jacob has a pretty great life. He's wealthy. He's got four wives, 11 of his 12 sons. Lots of great stuff. But in the back of his mind is a brother, a big, red, hairy brother who's really good at killing things and wants Jacob dead. Jacob lives under a shadow. He has a lot, but somewhere in the back of his mind, he wonders if what comes around is about to go around, and that brings us to our text. Jacob has just parted company with Laban to go out on his own. There's just one small problem. In order to get where he's going, Jacob has to pass through Esau's territory. There's a very good chance that what came around is about to go around. Last time Jacob saw Esau, Esau wanted to kill him. 
So Jacob has a plan. He's going to buy his way out of the conflict. Genesis 32, 1. Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. So he named the place Mahanaim. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my master Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goat, men servants and maid servants. Now I'm sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messenger, re messenger returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Uh-oh, this is not what Jacob had in mind. This looks like there's about to be armed conflict. Verse 7, in great fear, excuse me, in great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, that the other group that is left might still escape. Do you see the fear here? Jacob has a contingency plan that basically says, well, maybe this way I'll only lose half of my family and half of my wealth. Maybe I won't die. Now I have to ask you a question. Who is there in your life who gives you fear? Why do you fear them? Who have you wronged? What do they have on you? What would happen if what comes around would finally go around? Now here's a follow-up question. Is there a way to make it right? How much easier would it have been if you had dealt with it right away? Jacob's in a tough spot. Verse 9 says, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, Go back to your country and, I, and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy. <coughs> Excuse me. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. That's a prayer of humility. Next comes the praise for God's amazing provision. He says, I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Next, he makes his request and he confesses his fear. In verse 11, he says, Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. Can you identify the last part of this prayer? I hope you can because it's immensely important. Verse 12, But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. This last part is an expression of faith. It says, I have this fear, and yet I know what you promised. In the midst of the fear, Jacob claims the promise. He fears Esau will kill him, and yet the promise keeping God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob has made him a promise of prosperity, a promise that his descendants will become a great nation, unable to be counted. Jacob is in a place where he can't see how God will bring him through, and yet he trusts God to come through. How well do you trust God? Do you trust him enough to do what he says, even if it feels scary, even if you don't want to? Do you trust that God will keep his promises? Do you trust him enough to obey him and keep the promises you've made to him? What comes around doesn't have to go around. You can do what you can to make things right. That's what Jacob is about to do. Verse 13. He spent the night there. And from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats. 200 ewes and 20 rams. 30 female camels with their young. 40 cows and 10 bulls. And 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, Go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. He instructed the one in the lead, when my brother Esau meets you and asks, whom, to whom do you belong and where are you going and who owns all these animals in front of you? Then you are to say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are sent to my, a gift sent to my Lord Esau and he's coming behind us. He also instructed the second and third and all the others who followed the herds. You are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. 
And be sure to say your servant Jacob is coming behind us, for he thought, I will pacify him with these gifts I am sending on ahead. Later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he spent the night in the camp. What did Jacob do wrong to Esau? He deceived him out of his birthright and his blessing. He can't really get the blessing back. There's not much he can do about that. But the birthright, that's a different story altogether. First of all, when Jacob left, he left with nothing. The birthright did him no good at that time. Still, he was wealthy now. And he could give Esau a larger fortune than the one he would have received. But it goes beyond that. Did you notice Jacob said this, perhaps he will receive me. Jacob is doing what he can to make things right between him and his brother, not just so Esau won't kill him, but in hopes that their relationship can be restored. Maybe that's better than their father's blessing. Instead of what comes around goes around, maybe they'll have blessing and restoration. Now here's where it gets really good. For Jacob and us, this is where the rubber meets the road. Verse 22. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. Jacob sends everyone else and everything else ahead. And then in verse 24, so Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What's your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. Who was the man? He doesn't tell us his name, you might say. Well, I'll tell you his name. It's the name above every name. Jacob wrestled with Jesus. God in human form, taking on human strength and tangling with Jacob all night long. And I have news for you. This is exactly what we need to do when we realize that what comes around is about to go around. You've messed up and your sin has found you out. You know you're in the wrong and you know you're in trouble. Your enemy, the devil, is right there trying to make you the victim, making it someone else's fault, trying to keep you from looking at yourself in the mirror and looking God in the eye, trying to keep you from doing business with God and confessing and repenting and making things right. He wants to keep you in pride and in fear, unable or unwilling to repent, unable to forgive and to be forgiven. So what comes around and around comes around and goes around and around, and around, and around, and around. So you stay in a cycle of fear, and anger, and self-righteousness, and pride, and sin, and hurt, and pain, and don't miss this misery. Satan does it because he hates you, and he wants to destroy you. He wants to keep you in your mess. He wants to keep you from wrestling with God. Don't let him. God wants to tear down your defenses and your pride, so he can get at the root of your fear, so he can tear it out, and let you live in freedom. Jacob wrestled with God and wouldn't let go until he was blessed by God again. And there are times in our lives when we have to do the exact same thing. I know this because I have wrestled with God. I was in deep idolatry to my art career and I was ruining my life. I was ready to lose my marriage, my family, everything. I would feel God convicting me and I would counter with this is my God-given gift. I know you want me to use it, so let me use it and bless me. The problems with my family are their fault. They just can't see that when I make it and I'm famous, then I'll be able to give them everything they want, and they'll be happy, and then I'll be happy. I'll finally be happy. And God would convict me again. And I'd say, no, this is what you gave me to do. It's what you made me to do, and you're just not coming through. It's your fault I'm in this mess, God. Give me what I want, and I'll be happy, and I'll bless you, and I'll bless my family. They're just too short-sighted to see that I'm doing all this for them. 
If you come through and give me what I want, they'll see and my dad will see and I'll finally be the kind of provider he always expected me to be and all the mean kids at school will see that they picked on the wrong guy and they'll be sorry and they'll envy me. If you give me what I want, God, I'll show them all. You can keep fighting me if you want to, God, but I'm not going to let go until you bless me. And I hope this sounds crazy because I was. I was miserable. I was sometimes suicidal. And I blame God. And make no mistake about this, when I went through all this, I was a believer. God didn't give up. He would convict me again and again and again because what I couldn't see was he was fighting for my life. And I wasn't going to let go till he blessed me. The thing is, like Jacob, I was already blessed. My wife and my family were resting on the other side of the shore wanting me to come back. Finally, God hit me with a blow that made me let go of my fight. He said, your work is your idol. It's the God you trust in. It's the thing you run to when life hurts, when you should be running to me. Oh, I struggled against it for a while, but he took me to Washington, D.C. to stand in the gap, Promise Keepers event. And speaker after speaker showed me what God was trying to say. Finally, he had a man stand up and tell us to take the pictures out of our wallets of the people we had wronged and to pray face down in the dirt, looking at those faces as we prayed. And I broke. I couldn't fight him anymore. That may well be my hip wound like Jacob had his because it still often reminds me. And when I left go and stopped wrestling, he blessed me. He gave me my real purpose, which was to preach the word. He told me that my blessings were at my home, waiting for me to finally see them. And that one day, that gift of art that he gave me would be my tool to reach the world. But first I had to give it to him and let it go. I wrestled with God. He took it easy on me. He could have used his full power to crush me to dust. I deserved that, but he didn't do that. Instead, he just wrestled with me and all my garbage until I let it all go and he pinned me and I won. It's kind of funny. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, which means wrestles with God. That's the name God gave to his chosen people. It seems he really likes people who wrestle with him. He likes to tangle up with people who are stuck in broken patterns in a broken world as we wrestle with what it means to live in this world for Him. I think maybe God likes to wrestle with us because when it finally all falls away and we finally give in and lay our hearts on the line for Him, we're left where we need to be, in His arms. Guys, it's time to get real. It's time to wrestle with God. It's time to let Him deal with all your stuff. It's time to stop going around the same old stuff and the same old patterns over and over and over again. It's time to stop living in your pain and your fear and thinking anything in this world but Him can save us and make us happy. It's time to realize there are blessings all around us that we just need to see. And we need to see that we're already a blessed people who God loves. Wrestle with him. Let him deal with your stuff and let him fix you.